Good evening. We welcome you all to this second session of the marriage seminar. Um, we have in the schedule allowed about an hour and a half for this, and probably if I just went through my notes, I could be done in an hour. That's kind of the way I planned it. So I want you to feel free at any point when we're talking to raise your hand, or I might ask for some participation, because I really want you to be able to grasp what we're talking about and not just hear it. And that's also, as I'll explain later, one of the reasons for the uh, homework projects that we're going to give you, because we want you to, to uh, change as a result of this seminar. I want you to, your marriages to be stronger, not just that you'll learn how to strengthen them, but they will actually be stronger. So we're going to go ahead and get started on time, and uh, well, it's almost on time. So let's begin with prayer tonight. Father, I want to thank you for each marriage represented here in this room tonight. Um, I thank you that you delight in marriage, that it's your creation, and that um, it's one of those things that you desired to be a delight and a joy in our lives. Lord, we also realize how much sin has affected our marriages, and that's the reason we have to um, have a session like this is because as sinners, we really struggle in marriage as the most intimate of all relationships that you created on the face of the earth. I ask that you would guide us tonight, that we might learn not only the truth from your word, but also understand how we can practice it at home. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. This is session two of uh, our eight-session seminar. Uh, last time at the, at the Valentine's Banquet, most of you were there, but I'll, I know some of you weren't, so let me just catch up a little bit. We talked about keeping Jesus Christ at the center of your life. If you've looked at the schedule, that keeping Jesus Christ at the center of is our theme, and we're just going to apply it in a different area of each, each area, of eight areas. And here's the areas. Uh, Valentine Banquet, we filled in that bottom one, Jesus Christ at the center, and then the seven uh, bricks on top of the foundation there are the seven sessions that we have left, counting tonight. Um, so as of last week, we put Jesus Christ at the center, and the text we took was Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven to 40. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, this is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, I have to say I was really amazed when we got done Wednesday night. I had so many people come up and just express their appreciation for the, the talk when all I did, from my point of view, was to explain a passage of Scripture that I'm sure most of you have heard preached several times in your lives. And I want to tell you that that's what I have learned in the last few years. The power of, of Christian change is in, the, is in the Bible. It's not in what I say. It's not some new approach I have to marriage or, to, or some writer has to marriage. But are we taking the words of Scripture into our hearts and applying them? And so this whole session, at least... I'm not, I'm not done preparing yet. Uh, I, I, I think I told you Wednesday night, what I planned to do several months ago was to rewrite my premarital counseling program. Because when I, I designed it way back when I was in Nebraska, long before I knew much about counseling or about how God worked in his, through his word. And so it was a lot, a lot more man's ideas than God's ideas in my presentation. Everybody's appreciated it. And of course, I share my life with them and so on. But, so I wanted to rewrite it and make it more biblical. Well, I haven't got that done yet. And then I thought, well, when I get that rewritten, we'll adapt it and make it a, a marriage seminar. <laughs> so now here I am scrambling to prepare the marriage seminar so that then I can rewrite my premarital. So we're going backward. But what I want to do in our time here, um, almost every night, is just to focus on one or maybe two, at the most three passages of Scripture and just unpack that for you in each of the areas that we're talking about. So uh, 
last time we, we talked about these two great commandments. And we said that if you want to have a marriage that, that uh, blesses God, you're going to have to, first of all, be in right relationship with God himself. Uh, now, if we were not talking about Christian marriage, that wouldn't matter. They can do whatever they want. We can say, we can bring in the psychology, we can bring in man's ideas. But if we're talking about a Christian marriage, then we have to say, well, you're going to have a Christian marriage when you're a good Christian. <laughs> I've, I've often told people that I desire to have a Christian marriage, but that's not in my power to do because my wife is in the picture. Now, I have to be, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's two of us that have, to, uh, that have to be on the same page in order to have a Christian marriage. And so all I can be is a Christian husband. It's up to my wife to be the Christian wife that will be, that when the two of us are involved there, then we can have a Christian marriage. Same in a family. I can't have a Christian family. I can't have a godly family, necessarily. All I can be is a godly father. And to take it out to you folks, I'd love to have a godly church. But there's about 300 of us decide whether we have a godly church or not. All I can be is a godly pastor, and all you can be is a godly church member or a godly participant in the... So the point of Wednesday's message was you must be in right relationship with God if you want to have the kind of marriage God will bless. And so we looked at two commands. First, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and we added strength from, from the book of Mark. That's where we start. If you don't love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, don't expect to have a wonderful Christian marriage. Now, your wife also, or your husband also has to do that if you want to have that marriage, but at least you can start with you. And then the second commandment brings it to marriage, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And we made a point that the standard for that is as thyself. And if you remember, I put up the, the fake command, uh, the one we really like is thou shalt love yourself more than your neighbor or more than your spouse. That's where most of us live at least when we have any difficulties in our marriage. So if you, have, if you have difficulties in your marriage, the first place to look is, what's my relationship with God? Am I where I need to be with God? And secondly, have I put my spouse in proper relationship to me, meaning I'm going to love them the same amount I love me? And we talked about how difficult that is. That is difficult. That's, that's not just an easy statement, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Um, one of the uh, counselors that I've read, he writes about a, a marriage counseling situation in which the uh, couple is coming and they are coming because they believe divorce is their only answer and they just hope he will agree to that because that will help them, that will solve their conscience, salve their conscience that they'll go ahead and get the divorce because the, even the Christian counselor agreed we should get divorced. And so he told them, he says... Uh, well, you're right, uh, you're, you've got a real problem. There's only one thing you can do. And they expected, oh yeah, here it comes. He's gonna tell us to divorce. He said, there's only one thing you can do. That's you're gonna have to learn how to love each other. Well, because they understood love from a, a uh, uh, emotional point of view, they didn't know how that could ever happen because they didn't love each other emotionally right then. They kind of hated each other's guts. And, and so he says, well, you're gonna have to... Um, Love, he turned to the husband, you're going to have to learn how to love your wife. And he said, well, I don't know if I can do that. I, don't, I really don't love her. He said, well, can you love her as your neighbor? Because you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. He said, man, I don't even know if I can do that. He said, well, I guess we have to go to the last step then. Jesus said, love your enemies. So can you love her as an enemy? <laughs> the guy says, man, I can't get out of this. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so t tonight we're on session two, keeping Jesus Christ at the center of your love. We're going to talk about biblical love as it applies to the marriage relationship tonight. By the way, probably most of you could figure this out if you haven't already, but let me explain why marriage gets so much attention when we, when we deal with relationships. 
Marriage is a very unique relationship. It is just a relationship. It's a relationship of one person to another. You have that, you have relationships with other people in your lives. You have a relationship with a, a son or daughter or a coworker or a boss or a, uh, a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or a friend. But you don't have the same kind of relationship with them as you do with your, wa- your wife or your husband. I used to illustrate this in my desk with a ping pong ball that had a smiley face on one side and a frowny face on the other. And so I had a dividing line. And so I would say in most relationships, it, it's a gradual turn from happy to sad in the relationship or from uh, loving to mad in the relationship. I said, then I had a quarter in my desk and I drew a smiley face on one side of it and a frowny face on the other side. I said, this is marriage. It seems like you can flip from one to the other so quick and there's no, there's no middle ground. You, just, you can be happy with each other. You can have a wonderful time relationship one night and get up the next morning and be spitting mad at each other. And I've, it's, I've always been amazed at how quickly that transition happens. And the reason it happens that way is because you have the most intimate relationship of any that God has created. The only relationship he wants to be more intimate is his own relationship with us, and we struggle with that one because it's an unseen relationship. But for humans, two people who are married have the most intimate relationship. I'm not just talking about sexual, although that's part of it, but you are closer to each other, and everything matters to you more than in that relationship than in anything else. Since you, I I don't think most of you, any of you have been through my uh, premarital, I'll tell you this story. I said, if, imagine that I'm down on on, uh, Sherman Avenue, just walking along, minding my own business one night, and a guy from across the street hollers out and says, Peabody, you're a lousy pastor. I'm going to look at him, I'm going to wonder how he found out, I'm going to look at him and he's, I'm not going to lose any sleep over that. I'll probably take, go home and tell Royce and whoever else is at home and, and we'll laugh about it. I'll say, guess what happened to me today? Now, if on a Sunday morning, any one of you were to walk out about noon or 1230 when we get done and tell me that at the door, we're going to talk. I'm, I'm not going to let that rest. I'm going to want to get together with you that day or that week and find out what's going on. <coughs> If Roycey were to walk out at 12.30 on a Sunday morning and say, Peabody, you're a lousy pastor, I would feel like resigning immediately. Well, why is that? It's because the closer you come together in a relationship, the more everything matters. The more words matter, the more comments matter, the more facial expressions matter, the more uh, expectations matter. And that's why... We often have marriage seminars and we don't often have relationship seminars <laughs> because if we can get this one right here, then we can handle most other relationships. Okay, so of our building blocks here, we're going to take a, talk about love tonight. Let me tell you first what love is not. Now, the things I'm going to describe here are described as love in our society and I'm, I'm okay with that. When I say what love is not, I'm going to say what biblical love is not. First of all, it is not a warm, fuzzy feeling. Think back to the day you met your spouse. And maybe it wasn't that day that the warm, fuzzy feeling started. It might have been much later. But at some point, you looked at each other and something happened that was different than anything that had ever happened before. You, you saw each other differently and some things happened internally to you that we could call a warm, fuzzy feeling. Uh, I, I would guess, anyway, that most of you have been through that experience. You're agreeing with me? Okay. The world thinks that's when you get married. When you have that warm, fuzzy feeling, well, then you should just date until you are ready to get married. They think that's the basis for marriage. And that's why we have so much divorce. Because as you know, I think you could all testify, you don't have to raise your hands on this one, but I bet you could all testify that the warm, fuzzy feeling doesn't last forever. (laughs) But 
that's fun. And we call it love. And it's okay to call it that. We use love for a wide range of things, as you know. The second thing, it's not, it's not a physical attraction. I hope you have a physical attraction to each other. In fact, if you don't, that's often a, a cause for spending some time improving your marriages. But w- when we're talking about love tonight, we're not talking about a physical attraction. In fact, there are marriages where the physical attraction does not exist, and yet they can still have a quality marriage. And third, we're not talking about having fun with someone. In other words, some people say, well, man, we just have so much fun together, let's get married. Those three things are basically what the world knows of a marriage relationship. That's the basis on which, uh, I'm speaking uh, Western culture, by the way. When those things are true, they say, oh, we must, it, it's time for us to get married or live together or whatever, but let's, let's keep it with marriage for tonight. Uh, that's the basis. And how long does all that last? For some people, many years. For some people, two or three days. <laughs> uh, sometimes they don't even make it to the marriage, to the wedding, before, before all that has gone aside. Um, I speak about marriage with a unique perspective. I grew up in a culture in North Africa where marriages were not based on those three things at all. In Morocco, where I grew up, marriages were arranged. And I don't know, uh, it's been a long time since I was over there. Uh, I guess the last time was 38 years ago. So I don't know how much it's changed, how much they have westernized. But when I was there, a man and woman would get married without warm, fuzzy feelings, without a physical attraction, and having never had fun together because they've generally never been together. In fact, in many cases, they have never seen each other. Now, that really boggles your American mind, doesn't it? How could anybody get married without ever having seen each other? I was at a wedding a Christian young lady that we knew. The wedding lasted for three days. There was a three-day feast of her in her home and him in his home. The two had still never met. So they have this three-day gala where there's lots of food and dancing and and, uh, showing off the bridal's bridal's, uh, her trousseau and everything. She'd come out every every few hours in a new outfit and model for us and and very elaborate clothing. And then came the, the time when they would begin to live together. And here's what happened. A taxi arrived at her home with two of his friends in it. They said, we've come to take the bride to the bridegroom. So she came out. She was in a full-length hood. She couldn't see where she was going. We couldn't see her at all. They had to lead her out to the taxi they put her in the taxi and drove her to her, her husband's parents' home. We followed. We were by invitation. We followed. And so I was able to witness the rest of it. We walked into the home, and she was immediately taken into a bedroom off to the side. We didn't see her again. He's still out here celebrating with his friends and family. <coughs> and after a half hour, 45 minutes or something, he decides, okay, it's time for me to go in and visit my wife. Still hasn't met her, never seen her before. And so I don't understand this, but her, his mother put her foot across the door jam. There, we were in a big, a big room. There was a little room here and then the bedroom. And she, he went back and forth under her leg three or four times. I have no idea what that's about. And then he went into the bedroom. And there they consummated their marriage. There was no wedding ceremony, vows, and all those kind of stuff. Um, Because all of that had happened way back when they got betrothed uh, or committed to each other. That was the legal thing. This was just them coming together. And if you remember your your Bible, you remember that Jacob, remember, went and worked seven years for Rachel and then went into the tent. And not until the next morning did he realize it was the wrong woman. That was an arranged marriage. 
It was arranged anyway, but he thought he was going to get the right girl. His, fa his father-in-law was cheating him. But uh, when they woke, I imagine it was dark in the, in the bedroom. So when they woke up the next morning, that's when they saw each other. They'd probably already consummated their relationship, and now they saw each other. Now, take that picture and say, what would make a marriage like that work? Now, let me tell you another fact. When I was in Morocco, we have marriages like that, first of all, not based on love, but just based on whatever the families thought was a, a make a good match. Secondly, if a man wanted to divorce his wife, he didn't have to go file anything with a lawyer. He didn't have to get any papers, not even do-it-yourself ones off the internet. He just would walk into his house and say to his wife three times, I divorce thee, I divorce thee, I divorce thee. And she's out of the house. That's the end of the marriage. So we have marriage that's not based on relationship, it's based on um, arrangement. We have divorce that is extremely easy. Guess what the divorce rate was in Morocco when I was growing up? 2%. None, because they can't drink that in, in, the, in the Muslim culture. So what, what was making these marriages work? What, what, what are we doing wrong in our country so that we have harder divorces and much more involved relationships before marriage, and yet we can't seem to keep it together? No, it's not lawyers. Turn to 1 Corinthians 13 and we'll talk about it. Now, uh, I'm not, let me, let me rephrase that. I'm not saying that the Moroccan people did what we're going to talk about tonight. I believe the reason their marriages worked was because they had very low expectations. If they ever fell in love, it was after the wedding, not before. But if you didn't fall in love after the wedding, it didn't matter. You still had your, your roles to play. The, the roles between husband and wife are very uh, clear in a culture like that. The man works, the woman keeps the house and, and bears the children. What, he, what they both really want out of the marriage is children. The more the better. And so you can do that even if you don't have an intimate, rela I mean a, a, a warm, happy relationship. Um, but I want you to take, I'm going to take you to a passage of scripture in which we're going to understand love from God's point of view. And by the way, when the Bible was written, almost all marriages were arranged. Jacob and Rachel fell in love uh, before, when they first met, and so he was willing to work for her, but he could have had a good marriage with Leah if he'd done it biblically. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Let me read it for you, and then we're going to uh, talk through this tonight. He says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity... I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not, burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Talked about profit, profit this morning. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. And we could add from verse 8, charity never faileth. Now you'd say, I thought we were going to talk about marriage in here. Well, we are. What better place to practice love than in marriage? True biblical love. So this is not a, quote, marriage passage, but we're going to talk about it from a marriage perspective tonight. Let's look again from this passage at what love is not. Because Paul defines three things that marriage is not. In verse 1, marriage is not being a big marriage talker. You ever heard anybody talk about how wonderful his marriage is? or how good a husband he is, or whatever. Um, and, and to be able to address people and give lots of marriage counsel and so on like that. 
listen, listen to what he says. He says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. In other words, though I really can put the words together about any subject, particularly we're going to talk about marriage tonight. In other words, I'm a big marriage talker. I become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal if I'm missing something. If he's missing what? Love or charity. By the way, the King James uses the word charity, and I think that's actually a good word for us to use because when we use the word charity in English, we're talking about giving to someone who cannot give back. That's when we have charity. And that's a better description of Christian love than our, even, even our, our Christian understanding of love. Um, so, you, you think you can explain to everybody else what marriage is like? You think you, you really understand marriage? That's not what love is. Second, it's not being an amazing spouse. Look at verse 2. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, I am nothing if I'm missing charity. I, I looked at that and I said, okay, how do you relate that to marriage? Well, if I'm an amazing spouse, if I, you know, I buy flowers, not just on Valentine's Day, but maybe every week, every week of the year, or, and, and uh, every Thursday night I bring my, home a, my wife a big home of, I bring my wife home a big bouquet of roses, and I w- help her wash the dishes, and I take care of the children so she can have a night out with her friends, and, and I just am doing all kinds of wonderful things that sound wonderful in marriage, but I'm missing love. Paul says, I am nothing. Or being a selfless martyr. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned, it profits me nothing if I'm missing love. Have you ever met a selfless martyr spouse? I don't know why my wife doesn't like me or I don't know why my husband doesn't like me because I sure do a lot for her or him. I mean, I can just list everything I do for her or for him. And I don't understand why she doesn't reciprocate. I, I've done everything I know how to do. Well, maybe you're missing love. Okay? Tell me about those things. Do those things ring any bells with you? You've, you've met people like that, or maybe you looked in the mirror and saw somebody like that? You've heard about them? Okay. From, from your wife. <laughs> In this passage, Paul had just finished 1 Corinthians 12. You can follow the logic of that. This is 1 Corinthians 13. comes right after 1 Corinthians 12. And what was 1 Corinthians 12 all about? Who knows? Spiritual gifts. The kinds of things, everybody wanted the best spiritual gifts. Everybody wanted to, especially to speak in tongues or be a prophet or something like that. They wanted to draw attention to themselves with spiritual gifts. And Paul says, in the last verse of chapter 12, he says, um, but covet earnestly the best gifts and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And then he says, basically he says, these three verses, if we take them out of the marriage context, these three verses are all spiritual gifts in operation. Speaking with tongues of men and of angels, gift of prophecy, understand mysteries, knowledge, having faith, bestowing the goods that you know, you're giving, giving your body to be burned, you're sacrificing. That's the spiritual gifts in operation. If they are in operation without love, Paul says they count for zero. So he's going to show us a more excellent way. So let's spend some time with the next five verse, uh, four verses, four through seven. Now, I've said what love is not, so you'd expect that what I'd say next is what love is, but what what word have I got up there? What love does. I want to take 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, and specifically apply it to marriage. You can apply it to any kind of relationships, but let's specifically apply it to marriage tonight. So, um, and I want... I think this is going to be a good study because 
We are often eager to obey the Bible in all relationships except marriage. We, we hear 1 Corinthians 13 and we think about, well, how do, how do I behave to my coworker or how do I behave to my neighbor that's hard to get along with or how do I love my, uh, my father or my mother? And somehow we often skip right over marriage when we're trying to apply these things. And yet, I'll tell you, if, if you don't obey these in your marriage, you're not doing a whole lot of good to do it anywhere else. Your marriage is the most important place to apply these things. The reason I say what love does is because all 15 of these descriptions are action words. It doesn't show up that way in the English, uh, just because it's really hard to translate the action into English. We, we use words differently than they did in the, in the original. So we often have adjectives in the text. I just want to let you know they're all verbs. Every one of them is verbs. So we're talking about 15 ways that love acts or love does. Seven are positive, eight are negative. I don't know that that makes a whole lot of difference. But let's look at them. First one, charity suffereth long. Charity, charity or love shows patience to your spouse. Did I hit anybody already? Who are you most likely to be impatient with in life? Well, maybe if you've got some snotty kids right now, that might be the issue. But probably overall, we are quicker to be impatient with our wives than with anyone, or our husbands than anyone else. And again, it's because of the intimacy of the relationship and the expectations we bring to that relationship. One of the books I want to encourage you to buy is called What Did You Expect by Paul Tripp. And he talks about what we, our problem in marriage is, that, is what we expect. When I do premarital counseling, I try to identify expectations in the couple. But it's very difficult because those expectations are hidden way down deep inside somewhere. They don't, even, they don't even know they have them. I was 25 years married before I discovered one of Royce's expectations. I guess that's because she was very patient with me. I discovered that she expected me to keep the car clean. I didn't know that. I sometimes cleaned the car. I didn't expect her to do it, but I didn't know that she, I, it just mostly was dirty. <laughs> I just didn't expect to, I didn't know that she expected me to keep it clean. Well, why did she expect me to keep it clean? Because her dad did. She didn't know that. She didn't know she was developing that expectation as she grew up. She just watched her dad, and he kept the car clean, so she fell in love with me. Well, it was a wonderful day when we had those warm, fuzzy feelings and everything. She fell in love with me, and she just automatically transferred that thought to me because I was now the man of the house, therefore I was the one to keep the car clean. About the same time in our marriage, I realized she wasn't my ideal wife. Now, let me explain that. <laughs> As I was growing up, I developed a vision of my ideal wife. I'm going to represent it with my hand. Then I fell in love with Roycey, and because I was in love with her, I thought, she must be my ideal wife. And so I put, oh, this is Roycey, excuse me, this is my ideal wife, I put my ideal wife over her without realizing it. And the frustrating times in our marriage was when she stuck out somewhere behind that ideal wife that I had visualized. I don't even know that it was any specific, well, it probably was specific places. I don't know that I could mention any right now. But I suddenly realized after 25 years of marriage, no, I need to fall in love with Roycey, not my ideal wife. My ideal wife was some other woman, some other She's an imaginary woman that's in my, in my head. She's a unique person. I can, t I can tell one, th one, one thing. <laughs> Royce, Royce may find that she's better off not to come to this. <laughs> uh, I, appreciate, I appreciate Royce because she lets me be transparent. But anyway, Royce liked, likes to have a perm in her hair. And my ideal wife didn't ever perm her hair. 
And so for years I told her, no, you can't perm your hair, I don't like it. And one day I thought, what am I doing? Who says I get to be boss of her hair? She's, she's my wife, but I'm not in control of her hair. If she likes her hair that way, why can't I can't like her that way? Why can't I enjoy what she enjoys about her hair? That would be like loving your neighbor as yourself, right? I mean, I was, if I'm saying no to her perm, I'm loving, her, I'm loving me more than her. Um, and so she stuck out there, and so I kept pushing her back in behind my ideal wife picture, and it created a lot of conflict in our marriage. What, when is patience needed? Pardon? When there's an irritation. Does that sound right? Well, no, not all the time. I mean, when you're having a wonderful time together and you're on a wonderful date and having dinner at your favorite restaurant, you probably don't need patience with each other. Patience happens when something's gone wrong and you want it fixed right now. So showing patience to your spouse is a very important part of love. And you can show patience to your spouse even if you don't have any warm fuzzies for her. Probably most of us will sh- are quicker to show patience to somebody else than with our spouse. And, and that's again because of those expectations. So charity suffers Say it out loud. Long. What's long mean? 24 years. You can improve your marriage immensely. You can improve your marriage immensely if you will take those irritations and make them a joyful part of your relationship. I'm trying to weigh whether to tell a story. <laughs> um, and we're only on point number one here. Got four, 14 more to go. But I'll tell it to you because I think... I think it's a story that um, Rosie doesn't even know about. We, had a, we have a walk-in closet, and it, has, it had a door on it. And the door had a handle, like most doors. Now, the way the closet is arranged, my stuff is on the door side, and her stuff is on the non-door side. So when the door is open, I have to go around the door and somewhat close the door to get to the stuff that's behind the door. Well, Roycey developed a little habit. When she was getting clothes out of the closet and she didn't need them right then or she wanted to think about them later, she would hang them on the door handle. Now for her, that was great because she walked in and out here and there it was on the door handle over here. It wasn't in her way at all. But every time I went around, when she did that, every time I went around the doorway, I would hit those hangers, sometimes knock the stuff on the floor, have to hang it back up. And I was tempted to be impatient. In fact, for initially I was. I, I thought, should I talk to her about it? I, kn- I know she would change it if I talked to her about it, but should I talk to her about it? I finally decided, no. I'm going to leave it. And what I'm going to do every time I trip over a hanger is I'm going to smile and think that this is my way to just enjoy my relationship with my wife. She had no clue that this was happening. No clue that I was having trouble with those hangers. We took the door off now, so this is a moot story. But, uh, uh, but, but there was a place where I could have been impatient. You know, we, the old stories of you hang the toilet paper the wrong way around, or you squeeze the toothpaste in the tube, or you leave your, sock, your dirty socks on the floor. What are those but possibilities of impatience? They're irritations. You're not doing it the way I want you to do it. So what does love do? Pardon? Shows patience. It suffers long. That means that you don't tell her about it the first time it irritates you. I mean, if you have the right kind of relationship and you would tell her about it or tell him about it, probably there would be a change, unless it's a really ingrained habit. But love chooses 
to suffer for a long time. Even if it is a long time. Even if it never gets corrected. It shows patience. Okay, well, let's go on so we don't, are not here all night. What's the next one? Verse 4. It is kind. Now, okay, that's an adjective, isn't it? If you know English, it's a predicate adjective. Love is kind. Kind describes love. But in the original, no, it's, it's love. And there's no way to say this in English, really, but love does kind. So I put shows kindness to your spouse. It's the same thing in one sense, except I want you to realize that this is not just that you have to wait till you get kind. You can be kind at any point in your relationship, no matter what your spouse is like. You can be kind to a woman who yells at you. You can be kind to a man who is not nice to you, who doesn't come home, doesn't call before he stays at work late. You can still be kind, because kind is an action and it's a choice that love makes. You see how this comes home to marriage far more than you might have thought? Shows kindness. Well, okay, so your husband has a job. He's supposed to get off at 5, and he likes to have dinner at 6, and so you have fixed him dinner at 6, and he shows up at 7.30 without calling. Now, you you have to jump back to the first one now. (laughs) Love is patient. (laughs) But then how would love show kindness in a situation like that? Yeah. And when you get home, what could be her first words to you? Make cookies too. Very good. Yeah. Is everything okay? Did, did something go wrong? Not, where have you been for the hour and a half I've kept your dinner waiting in the oven? Now, which, which is more normal? Which is more typical? You're frustrated because you had an expectation and, she, and he didn't meet it. So kindness says, <laughs> what would bless my spouse regardless of what has happened? And kindness will show up best against a backdrop of somebody who didn't show kindness to you, somebody who didn't respond well to you. But now love is really acting here. And by the way, it's no trouble to love someone who's loving you greatly. If if somebody's doing all these 15 things to you, loving them back is not a hard thing. We love him because he first loved us, remember? So so the place that this love really needs to take place, or needs to act deliberately, is when the other person is not being loving to you. The time when love really comes to to play is when the other person is not being loving to you. In other words, now love is a decision, not a response. And the kind of love we're talking about here in in 1 Corinthians 13 is love deciding to do certain things. That's why why I impress on you that they're all actions. Okay, what's the next one? It's not up there yet. Uh, charity envieth not. Is not jealous of your spouse. Now, why would you ever be jealous of your spouse? Give me an example. It doesn't have to be your, doesn't have to be your example. Just some of you, one you've heard about somewhere. Okay. So she's jealous of you. Okay. Yeah. Yes. We've heard that one here in North Idaho. (laughs) We have examples, don't we? when we just wish we had it as good as our spouse has it. It may be more common of the wife to be jealous of her husband rather than the other way around, but I'm sure 
places like that too. Um, when I met Roycey and met her family, I was somewhat jealous of her family because I didn't have a family like that. And so I was, and I, that, that wasn't really a jealousy that interfered with us, but I remember, I remember having that feeling. So love doesn't do that. Now again, is not jealous makes it into an adjective. Love envies not the spouse. And remember, this is all this is actions, therefore they're decisions that a person, a person who's loving makes. Be not jealous of your spouse. Number four, is not puffed up, does not brag to your spouse. <laughs> you don't brag about how good you are. Now, I tell you, uh, we faced this, I would, I've faced this before, and this is how I handled it. And so you're bragging to your spouse about how good you are. I'm sorry, I, I read the wrong phrase. It's charity vaunteth not itself. Vaunt means to elevate yourself. I didn't treat you that way when... Isn't that bragging? Putting yourself up and putting her down or him down? Doesn't do that. Now, what that means is that often you're going to have to not say what you are thinking if you're going to be loving. Because <clears throat> initially, at least, until you mature, you can't stop the thought from going through your mind that I didn't treat her that way when... Or he didn't, I didn't treat him that way when he... Um, so we have to make a conscious decision. I am not going to brag about myself to my wife. I'm not going to put myself up and put her down. And by the way, you, it's pretty hard to put yourself up without putting her down. Well, it gets worse. It's not puffed up. It doesn't brag to yourself either. <laughs> um, probably number five comes before number four in the way that we operate. When I'm bragging to myself, I'm going to brag to my spouse about how great I am. Can you, can you see yourself in any of these things? I can remember a time when I, I realized now I was bragging about myself to my wife. I was putting her down. I was br and, and I started by bragging to myself in my mind. So that's the first five. No. Charity vaunteth not itself is bragging to your spouse and is not puffed up is bragging to yourself. <clears throat> I may be taking a little liberty there, but I thought... We do this. I know I do this. I'll think. Um, and this, I'm not necessarily talking here about a skill set as much as my behavior is better than her behavior, or her, my behavior is better than his behavior. And we think it, and that's bragging to ourselves, and then we say it, and that's bragging to our spouse. And so we've covered one verse, we've got the first five. And already, I think probably most of you have been humbled at some point because this was true of you. And we've got 10 more to go. <laughs> okay. Does not behave itself unseemly. So it has good manners to the spouse. How many, how many well, you don't have to raise your hands. How many of you men had to learn when you got married that you had to start picking up your clothes to make your wife happy. Seems to be a common, common issue. Uh, yeah. I, I got married throwing my stuff on the bed. I didn't throw it on the floor. I was, I was better than that, I guess. My mom had trained me better, but I did throw it on the bed. And uh, finally decided that was a waste of time because I guess... She didn't pick it up and put it away for me, so I eventually had to go pick it up, and that was more work, so I figured it's better just to hang it up when I took it off. But it has good manners. It, it, it treats her well, or treats him well. This could extend to things like opening the door for her, helping her on with her coat, some of those chivalrous things that we know in our society. But it's also just being, um, saying thank you for a meal, or... Uh, saying thank you for going out and working all day. 
It just has good manners. It, it uh, doesn't behave itself in a manner that, that would be considered rude. Sometimes, when a, when a person has very high expectations, even when the, other, when the spouse does something very good for them, it doesn't, get cre- it doesn't get credited because the expectations were so high and a negative statement will be made. H- how many of you men know that you don't get a lot of points by buying flowers on Valentine's Day? You get more points by buying flowers on January 15th or December tw- 2nd because there's no expectation. We just, we're almost forced to flowers and cards and candy at certain points of the year and to not do it, you're in trouble. <laughs> but to do it doesn't really get you a whole lot of points because it was expected. But we're just good manners to each other. We treat each other with honor. The whole idea of the chivalry was honor. I'm honoring my wife by opening the door for her. I'm honoring her by laying my coat across the mud pedals so she can walk through dry-footed or whatever. Um, it's, it's an honor to each other. If there's one place that I have had a habit of offending my wife, it's in not honoring her. We've had to work through that a lot of different ways. Praise the Lord, I'm finally getting it sometimes. Or, well, even, maybe even most of the time, I, but I still fall in that hole. Uh, when we get to uh, problem solving, we're going to describe how you get out of a hole you fall into because you will always... Or not, you will not always fall in holes, but you will, consi- you will fall in holes. You'll never, you'll never stop falling in holes. Let me put it that way. Uh, okay. And then the next one. It's not very encouraging? I think it is. Um, well, let me tell you why it is. When you fall in a hole, which, which means you offend, and you resolve it with forgiveness and con- confession and forgiveness you will have a stronger relationship than if you had never offended in the first place. I think that's, we'll talk about that later. I just think that's one of the neat things God built into sin. <laughs> Since we're going to sin, he's going he's gonna to build something into it that even, even our sin will praise him and, and, and bless us. Okay, did you all hear that? Mike said if he's hard on the children, it's a, a rude thing for his wife. Yeah, affects her that way. Yep. Good manners. Figure out what that means for you and your relationship, but you should be practicing good manners. And we're not just talking about etiquette, but honoring. Etiquette is designed as an honor. I, I had a, a teacher in boarding school in Morocco. Uh, she was from a British uh, family, and she had gone to British boarding school, which is very common in Britain, even for families that have schools locally. They'll send their kids away to a boarding school to get the, the right kind of training. They had a rule in that school that when they were at dinner, you could not ask for anything on the table for yourself. The idea was for you to observe the people around you And if you realized your neighbor needed the butter, you would ask the butter for her. She couldn't ask for butter for herself. So if you noticed her bread didn't have any butter on it, you would ask. She said they got around it by kicking each other and pointing to the bread. But what they were trying to teach with that was honoring each other, being aware of each other and thinking through what needed to be done. So um, it can be... In, in finances, you want to make sure your wife has enough money to do what you've, you want her to do in the home. Um, or if the wife handles the money, you know, make sure that the husband is, is uh, provided for and so on. Okay. Next one says, seeketh not her own. I ri- wrote that as does not demand your own way. Like about perms. What do you mean? 
Well, it depends. I mean, if you're if this is a matter of conviction, that's a little different. But but if you're only doing it because you like long hair, you like them to behave a certain way, and so you're insisting on it. But we're talking here not about family, but about about wives or, or husbands. We all have our ways of doing things. God seems to love to put together two people who are very different in their personalities. You've got an outdoor person, marry somebody that loves to stay indoors and read books. You've got the person that likes to keep the house all neat and orderly and the one that doesn't care. And I think he does that on purpose. (laughs) Because I think he does marriage not only because he wants to have children and and, and, uh, relationships like that, but I think he wants to grow us up. And marriage is the best way to do it. I tell people God's best tool for growth is trouble. And his best environment for trouble is marriage. <laughs> because you get, I mean, you, you go on these dates with this young lady or this, this man, and if you don't feel well, you don't go on the date. And when you go on the date, you spend time getting all dolled up and dressed up or whatever, and you go out with your best manners and you have a wonderful time together. That's not the same as living together 24-7. When suddenly, even when you don't feel good, you still have to date this guy. Quote, date. You have to live with this guy. Uh, Or he has to live with you if you don't feel good. Um, And so, somebody said to me the other day, I think all marriage trouble degenerates to selfishness. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. And selfishness demands its own way. You've got to put, you've got to, Wash, you've got to load the dishwasher the way I want you to load the dishwasher. And for a man to tell a woman that when the woman is loading the dishwasher, I don't know where even that comes from. But except that my selfishness, I think you ought to do it this way. Now, I might have some mechanical reasons for why I think it should be done that way. It's fine for me to explain it, but not to insist. Um, so love does not demand its own way. It seeketh not her own. Okay, the next one is not easily provoked. Doesn't get easily aggravated. There's a lot of overlap between these, isn't there? <laughs> if, you're, if you're not suffering long, you're going to be easily aggravated. And so I bet most of you can think of something your spouse does in the home that aggravates you. And you've talked to them about it before and nothing is changing and you just wish they would get it but you have a choice about whether to be aggravated about that or not. I remember a, a, a lady who was very frustrated because her husband used one end of the dining table for his office. And here she was trying to lay out a nice dinner and here's this pile of papers and newspapers and letters and bills and everything on this other end of the table. And she finally had to come to the point that she was going to love that end of the table. Otherwise, she got easily aggravated. Every time she saw it, it was a, it was a nuisance. It was wrecking their marriage um, because it, she, it bothered her so much. She wanted a clean, nice environment. She didn't get one. You know that God didn't say when you got married that you could have everything you wanted out of the marriage? Did you know that God didn't say that? He said, you're going to marry this person and they have as much rights in the home as you do. They have as much rights in the marriage as you do. So if one's messy and one's clean, does the clean one have the right to demand that the messy one clean things up? I don't think so. Now, you can talk about it civilly and and work out some arrangements if you can, but it does not get easily aggravated. And then let's go a step further. It says, thinketh no evil, does not keep a record of wrongs. I read a story of one counselor. A couple came in. And as usual, he just began to ask some questions about what was going on in the, in the relationship to find out how to help these people, what scriptures to take them to, and so on. And he asked the husband first, and he got a, you know, five or ten minutes of what was wrong in the marriage. And then he asked the wife, and she said, I'll tell you what's wrong with the marriage. And she brought out a sheaf of papers, almost a ream thick, closely typed bo- both sides, she had a record of everything that man had done wrong in 17 or 18 years of marriage. 
He told her to chuck it. He said, you are violating scripture. And he took her to this verse. He says, you are keeping a record of wrongs. That's what's wrong with this marriage. At least it's one of the things that's wrong. The best thing you can do is take that and put it in the trash can and let the garbage man take it. You've, and so he had to teach him about forgiveness and confession and so on like that. But love does not keep a record of wrongs. I tell you how to find out if your spouse is keeping a record of wrongs. Do it again and see what he or she says to you. If you get, you always do that or you never do that, those are words that say you're keeping a record of wrongs because you are counting. You may not have the exact number, but you are counting. So it does not keep a record of wrongs. Um, number 10. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. Iniquity there doesn't mean wickedness as much as it does injustice. It does not enjoy injustice. Well, where would injustice happen in a marriage? Give me some feedback on that. Okay, spending money. Like the one we've heard before about he spent $300 on a new rifle and, and two days out in the woods to, to kill a, a deer that's worth $55 in meat. And, uh, and he won't give me $20 to go buy a new dress. Okay. Another example? Time would be a good one. Okay. Often, I, I th the, the, the person that needs to take this into account often will be the husband. At least in most of the marriages in here represented in this room, I think the man is, is taking his position of leadership in the marriage and that means that he controls a lot of things in the marriage, not necessarily in a negative way, but he is controlling a lot of what's in the marriage. And therefore, the wife only gets what he allows her in money or time or whatever. So he, he said, well, oh, the guys and I are going out to lunch tomorrow. He doesn't stop to think, well, does she ever get to go out to lunch with her girlfriends? <clears throat> he would not enjoy that injustice if he was truly loving. He would, he would want to see things balanced. Um, not that you can balance everything to the, to the dollar and cent or to the hour, but you can at least recognize that I'm getting something that she doesn't get. I will confess to you that when we were raising our nine children, there were lots of days that I was very glad to go to the office, even to spend extra time at the office, because life was pretty hard at home. <laughs> Never stopped to think that when I went to the office, I left my wife at home to handle all this. Or the injustice of a man coming home from a day at work, somehow thinking that he has done his duty for the day when he served his eight to five at the office doing office work or whatever, and comes home and thinks he should be able to put his feet up, watch television, or read the paper. And his wife has been working all day with the children, and she's going to work all evening with the children while you have your feet up watching the ball game. That's injustice. Uh, actually, families where both couples work tend to do a little better on the injustice thing because I think the man realizes, oh, well, she's been at work all day today too. I don't know if you've heard this story before, but um, men often don't understand what wives do at home all day. It seems like they have a pretty easy job. I mean, they're just taking care of the kids and fixing some meals and stuff. And I'm out there, you know, building a house or running a business or something. So anyway, this one man came home one day, drove into his street, and as he came close to his house, he realized something was very wrong. He had four children, and three of them were in the front yard without any clothes on. And the toys were strewn all over. He had to park on the street because he couldn't even get into the driveway. And uh, he jumped out, jumps out of the car, wondering, his mind's going, what on earth has happened? He ran up to the oldest child. He says, where's mom? He said, I don't know. So he runs into the house. The house is a mess. The toys are strewn all over the living room, the dining room, and every other room in the house. The dishes are stacked up in the, in the sink, and it's, it's just a terrible mess. Dirt and diapers and clothes all over the place. And he finally finds his wife in the bedroom, reading a book and eating candy. And he says, honey, 
what is going on? And she said, well, you know when you come home and you say, what did you do all day? Well, today I didn't. <laughs> oh. You have to learn the hard way, I guess. Not only it does not in love injustice, but it rejoices in the truth, loves to know the truth. How many times does a husband or wife sometimes jump to a conclusion and then it's really hard to hear the truth about what happened? You come home at 7.30 instead of 6 and you're mad by the time he gets home. You've been steaming for an hour and a half and you let him have it and it's very hard for you to realize he had a good reason tonight and maybe even a good reason for not calling. Now maybe he didn't too, but you, you at least love to know the truth. And then we got a, we've got a quartet here to finish up. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Let me put some feet on those. It bears all things. It bears the spouse's irritations. <clears throat> I bet you can think of something that irritates your wife, men, can't you? Something you do that irritates her. And you wives can probably think of something you can do that irritates your husband. Love bears those things, puts up with them, realizes that it's not my job necessarily to take care of all those irritations. Turn them into something good. Turn them into a, a loving thing for your wife. Then it says, believes all things. It believes the best of your spouse. Believes the best. Not the worst, but the best. Now, Somehow we're prone to that, the, to believing the worst. I remember one time after, shortly after we got here to Coeur d'Alene, Royce went to Spokane. It was her first time to go to Spokane alone. And we were from a little hick town in Nebraska, so Spokane was a huge city. And uh, we didn't have, we were, this was before cell phones. So when she left, I had no way of, of communicating with her. And she was late coming home. You know, why is it that we don't think, well, she probably shopped a little longer than she thought or the traffic was heavy or something like that. Why is it we don't think about those? When she got home, I had, I don't know how many children we had then, seven, I guess. I had all seven of the children down on the knees in the living room. We were praying for her because we thought just something terrible had happened to her. Well, we do that with each other as well. When something goes wrong, we tend to believe the worst rather than the best. If your husband stayed away too long, and he's got a cute secretary, what, what's the best you can believe about him? And that, and that will come up with the next one. Uh, hopes all things. I put trust the spouse, and then in parentheses, until proven otherwise. There are times that we find out that our spouse has not been what he ought to be or what she ought to be. Maybe even to the point of some unfaithfulness or some, uh, some grievous sin. But let's not imagine it before we know that it happened. I was speaking with um, two brothers one time. They came in to try to reconcile. And the upshot of it was the older brother called the younger brother a pathological liar. Now, first of all, I looked up that word, and it meant that he has no choice but to lie. So I thought, well, they're both believers. That can't even be true. There is no such thing as a Christian pathological liar. He can always change by the grace of God. So I, when they got together, we talked about it. It was really hammering back and forth. And finally, I turned to the older brother and I said, tell me why you call him a pathological liar. Now, I believe the men at that point were 35 and 28. The story I got happened when the younger brother was 10 years old. He told a lie and his brother had never forgiven him for it. And so he would not trust a word he said now, 18 years later, even though he couldn't point to a lie that had happened in those 18 years. So in desperation, I finally turned to the older brother and I said, would you be willing to turn to your brother now and tell him that from now on, you will believe everything he says until you find out that he did tell you a lie, and then you will deal with that in a biblical, you'll deal with a lie in a biblical fashion. Well, he never did agree to that, so they parted, they left still at odds with each other. We need to trust each other. These are kind of connected, you know, believing the best and trusting the spouse. 
Um, and then finally, endures all things, endures trouble from the spouse. Sometimes what our spouses do cause us trouble. Your wife goes out and uh, without realizing it, spends a lot of money or maybe spends money you didn't have. She put it on the card and you don't have any way to pay the card off. Or I, I talked to one uh, man who, whose wife cost them $10,000 um, by listening to a scam on the radio. Um, and they had to swallow it and go on. I cost us far more than $10,000 in a couple of different situations. Sometimes because I was being, wanting my own way. And my wife has loved me. She has endured that trouble. She's gone with me, th gone through it with me. And we've had to pick up the pieces and, come and graduate together. Endures trouble from the spouse. Now, okay, that's 15 things. I hope that this was a good shotgun tonight that hit you somewhere. Um, as, a, as a home project, I would like you to evaluate your own life by these 15 things and identify at least two things you can change in your home this week. We actually have three weeks. Uh, but this week, that would improve your biblical love toward your spouse. That's a project for each one of you to do for the other. Okay? But let's go on. I, I want to show you, some of this has been negative and hard. Let me just show you what, how Jesus operates toward us. Um, and I think I've got something out of the line here. Uh, turn to 1 John 3.16. I referred to this uh, Wednesday night. This is the other John 3.16, and it says almost the same thing the first one does. 1 John 3.16 says this, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Let me rephrase that. We ought to lay down our lives for our spouses. If you want to act in love like, like God did, then that's the way you'll do it. Let me skip over a couple of things here. Um, so love is giving. Notice it says he laid down and we ought to lay down our lives. That's giving. There's a quote in the book that I'm going to recommend tonight. It says, you should want to be married because you would rather give to your spouse than anyone else. He's telling premarital couples that. You shouldn't want to get married because you're in love. You should want to get married because you want to give to that person more than you want to give to anybody else. That's a unique phrase, isn't it? And I think when we're married, we should want to give to our spouse more than anyone else. We should just love that. How, how can I give? Let me tell you a quick little story. I have been a stingy man all my life. I don't know when it started, but at least as far as I can remember, I've been stingy with money. I love to have people give me money. I don't like to give anybody else money. That was, that was my basic attitude. And uh, right up here, preaching on Sunday morning through Ephesians a couple of years ago, God convicted me. He had convicted me before, but this time he told me to do something about it. We were, that passage in Ephesians 4.28, let him that stole steal no more, rather let him labor, give, um, working with his hands that which is good, that he may have to give to him that has need. I suddenly, I'd said, I said it publicly to all of you. I said what God means is that he's giving most of us enough money to give some away. But I find myself resisting that. And so I thought, well, how can I change that? I've been a counselor long enough to know that I have to change in concrete, not in abstract. So I put a little note in my prayer list every morning. Every morning I ask God to show me who I can bless with money or time this week. And something wonderful has happened. I have become a giver, a joyful giver. I don't know how many, most, I don't have a lot of money to give away so it's not huge sums, but almost every week I can point to something where I have given money or time to somebody when in the past I wouldn't have done that. I would have said, no, I need to save that for myself. 
Now, I'm looking, looking at this and say I should have, how can I bless my wife this week uh, with something? Okay, then back um, to Mark 10, 45. This is the verse I would like you to put on a card this week. Excuse me, that I would encourage you to put on a card this week. Mark 10, 45 says this. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Who's our model? Jesus. And he didn't come. If he had gotten married, he wouldn't have gotten married so his wife could serve him. He would have gotten married so he could serve his wife. That's what that verse means. So let's apply it that way. For even the husband came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for his wife. Or even the wife came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give her life a ransom for her husband. Not a ransom, because we can't do that, but to give her life for her husband. So love is serving. Marriage is serving, which is always seen as a choice and never seen as a burden. Now, when, it'll seem like a burden when you feel like you're giving more than she is giving or than he is giving. But if you choose to give, then it will never seem like a burden because you're choosing to do that. Just like I'm choosing to give now, that giving is not a burden. I, I, I'm amazed at the transformation in myself. And I love it. I mean, I'm 66 years old and I finally get that straight. Um, well, 64 when I got it straight, but anyway. And then lastly, John 15:13. This thing doesn't want to behave. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. How about if we rephrase that? Greater love hath no man than no husband than this, that a man that a husband lay down his life for his wife. Or greater love hath no wife than this, that she lay down his li- her life for her husband. One of the teachers I had down at, at, uh, when I did my master's, counseled regularly, and he often counseled marriages. And he was counseling, he told us a story, he was counseling one man that was in a very, very difficult marriage. His wife was not a Christian, and she was mean, she was abusive, she was everything. And he just patiently was working with this man over the years to be a godly husband to this ungodly wife. One day he came to counseling, And he said, let me tell you what happened this week. He said, I woke up in the middle of the night on Thursday night and my wife was sitting on my chest and she had a butcher knife in her hand and she said, one of these days I'm going to kill you. And the counselor said, I have never recommended separation and divorce to any couple, but in your case, I wonder if it wouldn't be better. That was the counselor that said that. You know what the man said back to him? He said, if I went to Africa to some headhunting tribe to preach the gospel and I lost my life doing it, what would you call me? And the counselor, seeing the way this is going, says, I'd call you a martyr. He said, well, I believe I'm in my marriage to bring my wife to Christ. If I have to give my life to do it, I'm willing. Counselor said, I was ashamed of myself. Now, that's a very unusual husband to say that, but he understood love. He understood biblical love. And I want to translate it this way. Love is what you give in the 10,000 little moments of your daily life together. It would be one thing for you to give your life, your physical life for your husband or wife. Probably most of us would be willing to do that. But what about all the little times when we just as soon have our own way instead of their way and we have to give our lives for them. That's what giving your life means, isn't it? That your life doesn't matter and theirs does. Your way doesn't matter, their way matters. Okay, projects to do. These are listed on the back so you don't have to take notes. I just want to review them with you. Every week when we get together, or every session, I want to give you something practical to do because 
you won't change your marriage in here. You will change your marriage between now and the next session and then for all the years after. So uh, you'll have to do something at home or all of this time together will be not wasted, but not a whole lot of good, okay? So number one, write Mark 1045 on a three by five card and review your cards daily. By the way, the, the one from last time was 37 to Matthew 22, 37 to 40. If you missed the Valentine's banquet, I've got the uh, gross projects from the first week there as well. Now, wh- what's, what's this gonna do? You're gonna take a verse of scripture that we've talked about tonight, we've kind of fleshed it out tonight, and you're gonna let God remind you of that verse every day from now to the end of the seminar. That's, that's my, my encouragement, is that you review it every day from now to the end of the seminar, which is the end of April. That's a month and a half. So for 45 days, you're gonna review this card every day. And, and what I encourage you to do is to read it out loud. That way your mouth says it, your eyes see it, and your ears hear it. And if you're familiar with learning styles, that covers them all. <laughs> um, but what'll happen, we're gonna move on and we're gonna talk about other areas, but I still want you to serve your wife and your husband. God still wants you to serve your wife and your husband, so he will be able to remind you every day, oh, that's right, the, the wife came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give her life a ransom for her husband and so on. Um, so even though we'll move on to other areas, God will still remind you of these things that we've covered. Secondly, continue to pray regularly for yourself and your spouse. I encourage you to spend five minutes a day at least doing that and to keep a journal of uh, prayer requests and answers. Um, This could be something you could pray with each other or it could be something you do on your own. Number three, on a scale of one to 10, rate your biblical love toward your spouse. I would like you to use uh, 1 Corinthians 13, four through seven think through those 15 things and say, okay, how am I doing? Am I at a six? Am I at a three? Am I at a one? Am I at a, nobody's at a 10. You can't use 10. Um, (laughs) Otherwise you can't do step two. It says under that list two action steps to improve your rating. (laughs) Okay, so um, what I want you to do is say, and I'm gonna do this as well. Roshi and I are doing these projects along with you. I'm gonna rate my marriage. I'm gonna say, okay, and it really doesn't matter if you rate yourself hard or easy because the next thing you're going to do is two action steps to improve your rating. So if I find myself struggling with irritations or injustice or not believing my wife or not trusting my wife or whatever, I can identify something I can do to change that. It might be to memorize a verse of scripture that relates. It might be to uh, confess to my wife that I've been doing that and I I want to change. But two action steps to improve your rating. Um, and then finally, oh, this is explained better on the sheet. Two examples to convert to biblical love. What I want you to do is think about this. I want you to go over the past week and think of two times that you func- you acted not in biblical love to your spouse and then think through how could I do that different? How would I, how would I do that differently if I was loving him or her biblically? So let's say you got irritated and expressed it. Just rewrite that story and say, here's what I should have done if I was being biblical. And that will help because you'll already start putting some new paths in your brain to say, oh yeah, this, I did it this way, but that was wrong. I'm gonna, I should have done it this way. Advanced, on the back side of the note sheet back there are a bunch of passages. I think there's uh, 12 or 13. And what I would like to recommend that you do is that you read that passage, they're all about the Lord Jesus, and then say, in this passage, how did Jesus reflect Mark 10, 45? That he came not to be served, but to, be, but to serve. In that passage, how did he do that? And there's a little space for you to write that. And then I would encourage you to purchase the book, uh, Tying the Knot, uh, by, Bruce, by Rob Green. I got a copy of it here somewhere. Uh, Amazon has it, I think it was 1710 or something like that. I, I'm sorry about the price of books these days. I used to buy a paperback like this for 35 cents. Um, this is the book I'm using as a basis for what we're talking about, but he's a lot more, 
human words about the issue, and I'm presenting the, the biblical passages. So his, his words are good. Uh, it's actually written for premarital couples, so you'll have to translate that. But um, the, if, uh, if you read the first two chapters, you'll be caught up. Uh, the first, two, first chapter is Jesus must be the center of your life. The second is love with Jesus as the center. So that's right along with what we've been doing. Next time, we'll talk about problem solving. So if you, want, if you have time to read ahead and get there, we'll, that'll help on some of that. Now, I'm going to do a special deal because I know books are expensive. If you are here by 6 p.m. on March 11th, uh, that's um, three weeks from now, we'll enter your name into a drawing and we'll draw your name out and you will receive one of the books I'm going to be recommending for this series for free. So now what do you have to do to get your name in the drawing? You have to be here by 6 so we can start right at 6, okay? All right, the project list and course schedule is near the door. We're, we're going to kind of skip around on the Sunday nights. All the meetings will be on Sunday night, but they won't be consecutive because of vacations and absences and trips to Belize and, and Israel and things like that, uh, and not the first Sunday of the month. So if you take that sheet and put it on the refrigerator or something, you'll always know when we're going to uh, have our next meeting. So the next time will be March 11th. Any thoughts or comments, reactions um, from tonight? Well, is it a long question or a long answer? Okay. All right. You can ask me that anytime. Anybody else? I encourage you to rethink love. I remember... I was teaching in Nebraska or in Portland years and years and years ago. I mean, that's a lot of years ago. I was talking about love biblically as compared to love the way the world sees it. And um, this will date me. I, I decided to play a country song as an example of worldly love. And so I brought out my little cassette tape recorder and set it on the platform and punched the button and played it, you know, put the microphone down to it. Um, you know, when is the last time you saw a cassette tape recorder? But anyway, yeah. <laughs> and I, I played that, and, and because I was thinking about what I was going to say and everything, I was looking down. And somebody came to me after and said, did you realize what happened when you played that? I said, no, what? He said, people really began to squirm because that's the kind of music they listen to during the week, and that's the kind of idea of love they're getting from the music. And they suddenly realized in the church context how terrible that song you know, sounded. It was, it was one about, you know, I don't love you anymore, and therefore I'm going to go find someone else to love. That's a totally worldly view of love. You can love, any two Christians can have a wonderful relationship with each other um, if both of them will exhibit biblical love toward each other. And you can have a satisfactory marriage if you simply are biblically loving your spouse, even if they're being very ungodly, like the man I told you about. You, um, we're used to that in, 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 in missions that we'll give our lives for somebody. We're not used to that in marriage. But biblical love calls for that kind of love. It's me giving to you, and it doesn't matter if you give back to me, and that's why I like the word charity. Okay? All right. Next time, we're going to talk about problem solving. Um, you could also call it conflict and resolution, but uh, that will be a, a good, a good uh, session. And my wife and I, I tell people, we're, we make good marriage counselors because we have fought so much in our marriage. <laughs> Uh, you, on Wednesday night you heard about that but anyway okay let's let's close in prayer Father in heaven we thank you for this time together thank you for giving us a passage of scripture that truly convicts us no matter where no matter how well we've learned to operate in our marriages I thank you that you can convict us with a passage like that and show us how we can grow 
And so I pray for each of these couples as they do that this week, that you will show them where they fall short and you will show them specifically how they can begin to be obedient to the biblical love you've called us to. I pray that you will also give them strength for the times when that biblical love is very, very difficult or when it requires them to say no to themselves in order to love the spouse. Thank you for this time, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, first week's projects as well as the second week's projects are back there and also the, uh, cor- the course schedule. Thank you for coming and uh, and hope to see you every week as we continue on through the end. You're welcome. For making me heard. <laughs> <laughs>